Hello everybody, my name is Roger and welcome to my channel, Roger's Reads. So today I'm doing the second part of my November wrap-up. As always, I break my wrap-up into two parts and, uh, and I will include a link to every book I mentioned as well as the time where it occurs in the video so you can quickly jump to that section if you so choose. So the first book that I read this month was entitled The First 15 Lives of Harry August, written by Clara North. So the first 50 lives of Harry August follows a main character, Harry August, who lives his life over and over and over again. But it's always the same life and he always returns to exactly where it began, as his mother gave birth to him in the, in the ladies restroom. Now once he reaches the age of 6 to 7, all of his memories return, complete with all of the knowledge he's amassed in his previous lives. So think of kind of like the movie Groundhog Day, except for an entire lifetime. Now it's also worth mentioning that Harry is especially gifted in that he's a mnemonic, meaning he remembers every single detail from each of his lives. Kind of like a photographic memory, I guess. Now what's interesting though, is that he doesn't live exactly the same life each time and can actually choose to do whatever he wants to during his lifetime, uh, whether it be teaching at a university, uh, becoming a scientist, uh, becoming a lawyer, a doctor, a physicist, uh, living in Russia even, whatever he wants to do. So finally, during one of his lives, he learns that there are others like himself who call themselves the Kala Chakra, which I believe is Buddhist terminology for the Wheel of Time. So, the Kala Chakra have formed a club called the Cronus Club with branches all over the world with the goal of helping each other out, especially during the uh, challenging childhood years. So, imagine being 800 years old and having to live as a child once again under the thumb of your parents until you uh, come of age. But they, but they do have their rules. They are not allowed to do anything that will drastically change the future. For instance, they cannot kill Hitler or stop John F. Kennedy's murder or introduce uh, future science or future technology, anything for that matter that could cause a ripple throughout, uh, throughout history. So what I found fascinating is how the club members pass messages to each other through time. How this works is that a child gives a message to another member when he or she is very old. So that when that old person passes and is born again, they can then pass on that message to other members who are nearing the end of their life. So this way the past connects to the future and the future connects to the past from one lifetime to another. So these messages are just passed down like this, so it's very cool. But one day, at the end of Harry's 11th life, a little girl appears at his bedside and warns him that in the future a global catastrophe occurs and that he and the other members have to do something to stop it. But as Harry and the other members of the Kronos Club investigate, they soon discover that it is one of their own that's to blame. One of the Kala Chakra is breaking the rules. And now it's up to Harry to figure out who is doing it, when they're doing it, how they're doing it, and to somehow stop it from happening. So I really loved the immense scope and scale of this story and felt that it was an extremely well fleshed out version of time travel. So how many times have most of us thought about how different our life would have been had we taken a different path? So this book explores just that question as it's a book about what we could accomplish if we had eternity. So uh, yes, yeah, so I found this absolutely fascinating. But then again, I'm a sucker for a time travel novel and uh, this was definitely one of the better ones. Now, I will admit that initially <laughs> it was kind of rough going for me with this book. I actually considered DNFing it about 60% in. Because the story is told from multiple timelines which took a little bit of getting used to. But more than that, this is a rather dense book and it takes quite a bit of time for the story to develop. But once it did, boy oh boy, what a ride it was. So I'm really glad I stuck it out because it was so worth it in the end. So the next book that I read this month was entitled The Dreadful Objects by Chris Cooper and I also read this book as an ebook so I don't have a physical copy of it. 
So, The Dreadful Objects follows our main character, Jamie Lawson, who has been in a major rut and has been unable to move on with his life following the death of his girlfriend a year earlier. He then learns that his uncle, a famous and quite wealthy horror author, has committed suicide but has bequeathed Jamie all of his possessions, including a couple of million dollars and a big, creepy and spooky mansion filled with macabre uh, horror memorabilia. So Jamie inadvertently discovers that the events in his uncle's horror books actually happened in real life. Now, that might not seem all that surprising, except that all of the events that took place in the books occurred after the books were written. So Jamie decides to dig a little bit further to see if he can discover uh, other connections and learns that two items that are locked in a glass case appear to be linked with real life deaths and might hold the key to figuring out why his uncle killed himself. So as Jamie puts together more and more pieces of the puzzle, he begins to realize that the mystery may be even stranger than he initially thought, and may in fact be paranormal. <laughs> Hint, it is. So though this novel is classified as a horror novel, and is a bit on the scary side, true horror fans might be a little bit disappointed. It's true that the story is dark at times and definitely tells a suspenseful spooky tale, but it does so, I guess, in more of a light-hearted way. So, as such, I thought that this novel might be better placed in the cozy mystery genre, or perhaps the cozy horror genre, if there is such a thing. But all in all, The Dreadful Objects was a twisty, wildly entertaining story with uh, relentless pacing, rich, lifelike characters, and a brilliant ending, which made this novel a real page-turner for me. Oh, and in the spirit of disclosure, I won this book in a Goodreads drawing and was under no obligation to leave a review. So, uh, yes, yeah, so that's it for the uh, Dreadful Objects. Recommended. So the next book that I read in November was a graphic novel, actually, entitled Blue is the Warmest Color, written by Julie Moreau. So this is a wonderful graphic novel that follows our main character, Clementine, a French junior in high school. So one day while walking down the street, she happens to notice a girl with blue hair. What Clementine isn't prepared for, however, is an unexpected twinge of desire. So much so that the girl begins to enter her dreams in an erotic manner, causing all kinds of confusion for her heroine as she begins to question her sexuality. So later, she wanders into a gay bar with her best friend, where she re-encounters the girl with the blue hair and learns that her name is Emma. So the attraction between the two is pretty much instant and electric, and it doesn't take Clementine long before she realizes that she has fallen in love with Emma. But acceptance of her newly emerged sexuality doesn't come easy for Clementine, and we experience the battle that she goes through not only internally, but also amongst her peers at school uh, surrounding her uh, forbidden attraction. So the novel is about finding and accepting yourself even though everyone around you tells you that you're wrong, that the love that you feel is wrong. So it follows in a heartfelt coming-of-age story of first love, uh, self-discovery, and ultimately tragedy. Yes, there is tragedy, but it's something that we learn right away in the opening pages, so I'm not spoiling anything. So, though it's a beautiful love story, it's also a heartbreaking one, one that's uh, difficult to read in parts. This is as much a coming-of-age story about a girl's awakened desire as it is a story about hardship and loss. Blue is the warmest color is an emotionally expressive and exquisitely drawn book about love, loss, depression, uh, trauma, bullying, acceptance, homophobia, and so much more. And uh, just on the ill, beautiful, beautiful illustrations. And actually the illustrations are all black and white, and the only part that's blue is the hair. You can get an idea of that. So, 
This is a dark book in places, uh, filled with angst and fear, but it's also a beautiful, swirling, romantic sweep of a book chock full of gorgeous, evocative images that render this graphic novel a beautiful work of art, in my humble opinion. So, all in all, this was not only a well-told, deeply moving tale, but also a heart-tugger of a story that sticks with you and gives you plenty to think about afterward, or at least it did for me. So, uh, yeah, so if this sounds like something you'd enjoy, definitely pick up a copy of Blue is the Warmest Color. Excellent story. So the next book that I read in November was entitled Pisces Hooks Taurus, written by Anita Sunday. And I actually read this book as an ebook as well, so I don't have a physical copy, so I'll either put it here, here or here. So this is the fourth book in the Signs of Love series by Anita Sunday. I actually uh, started with book two in the series, which was um, Scorpio Hates Virgo, and I loved it so much that I went out and got the rest of the series. And uh, I'm really a fan of this author, and I've now read uh, several other books by her as well. So she writes gay romance novels, and many people refer to her as the Queen of Slow Burn, because she specializes in this slow burn romance. And I think that's why I enjoy her books so much, because I really love this trope. And she also does the enemies to lovers trope in uh, some of her novels, which I also really enjoy. So, on to Pisces Hooks Taurus. So this follows Zane, a Kiwi, who has a month left of his visa before he ship he shipped back from the U.S. to New Zealand. But he really, really wants to stay in the U.S. because he wants to stay close to his brother and his brother's wife. He's also, Zane is also best friends with his brother's wife, and his brother and his wife have just become parents. So Zane's a brand new uncle. So it's going to be really hard for him to leave back to New Zealand. So Zane has a plan. He's going to find the perfect girl of his dreams on one of the dating apps, fall in love, marry her, and then get to stay in the States. So that's the plan anyway. <laughs> oh, and all this is going to happen in one month. But first off, he needs to find another place to stay. So he asks a friend of his brother's wife, a professor named Beckett, who he's never met, if he can crash with him temporarily. So what follows is a delightful slow bird romance between Beckett and Zane. But it's not an easy road. So Zane is pretty much clueless that his so-called bromance with Beckett may be something deeper. And we also learn that Beckett is still brokenhearted and deeply scarred from a past relationship and is determined not to get his heart broken again. So I ended up really loving both of their characters. So Zane, our Pisces, he's young, naive, romantic, and somewhat of a dreamer, so in this way he comes across as being quite innocent. He's also charming and super sweet. Now Beckett, on the other hand, our Taurus, is mature, more serious, intellectual and studious, though somewhat insecure and mistrusting of others following that uh, horrible breakup that I mentioned. So it was really a delight watching the slow burn between the two of them as Beckett would continuously erect borders with our clueless Zane unknowingly tearing them back down. What I liked is the balance in the story. So here we have two very different personalities. On one hand, a totally innocent and naive character, and on the other, one who's jaded and distrusting. So as the tension builds, we see our bull lowering his guard and our fish growing in maturity and wisdom. I also love how both of these characters really grew by the end of the story. So, all in all, Pisces Hooks Taurus was another lovely and sweet story by Nita Sunday that made me a little misty-eyed at the end, as do most of her books. It's the kind of story that makes you laugh and cry and really ends up tugging at your heartstrings. You know, it's a story in which both of our characters knew what they wanted, it just took them a while to get there. So, uh, so yeah, I'm really loving this series, the, the Signs of Love series, and can't wait to read her next book when it comes out. So the next book that I read in November was entitled The Grim Life by K.D. Worth. 
And I also read this in ebook formats so I don't have a physical copy. So when I learned that this book was about Reapers, I immediately picked it up because I love Reaper stories. In fact, there used to be this television show I used to watch called um, Dead Like Me, which followed a group of young Reapers. And I think I've talked about it a bit on this channel. I just remember I was so disappointed when it was cancelled. So anyway, on to the grim life. So this book follows Max Shaw, a teenage boy who dies on prom night. I know, sad, right? Well, Max's story isn't quite over. Moments after his death, he is recruited by a mysterious tattooed man named Slade who hints that he's perhaps an angel. And he offers Max the opportunity to stay around on Earth a while longer by joining his, his group of teenage reapers. So they're not really teenagers. They are, but they're not. I mean, they may have died as a teenager, but some of them have been reapers for decades. So, so, they, so they definitely have many more years of maturity than Max. So Max, he's pretty happy about being a reaper and hanging out with all his reaper compatriots, but it all changes one night when Slade assigns him his first suicide case. So Max shows up at the bridge where supposedly his charge is going to jump and there he discovers a boy about the same age as himself. So Max is heartbreaking by the idea of this boy's suicide so he makes a split second decision defying all of the rules of the Reaper. He prevents the boy from killing himself which means boy is he going to be in trouble. So, the boy that Max saves, we learn that his name is Cody Michaels, and he's desperately struggling to reconcile being gay with his Christianity. So now, Max only has one night to save Cody before another Reaper finishes the job that uh, Max lacks the courage to complete. He also has to somehow convince Cody that life is worth living so the boy doesn't end up back on that bridge. It's also worth mentioning that there are evil entities called Shades who have found a way to walk the earth and it becomes apparent that they have their uh, sights set on Cody. Now, I'm not going to say anything more about the plot lest I ruin anything. I will say that I really enjoyed watching Max and Cody's friendship and affection develop. But there were plenty of heartbreaking scenes as well. I mean, Cody's years of hopelessness and destroyed self-esteem aren't something that can be overcome in a single day. So my only niggle with the book was with the preachiness. So this book had quite a strong religious message with which we were hit over the head over and over again and it made me a tad uncomfortable. So people who aren't necessarily religious may find some of the passages a bit cringeworthy. But still, this was a good story and I thought that the author handled sensitive topics such as uh, bigotry, suicide, uh, grief, gay conversion therapy, and religion uh, well, pretty well for the most part. The book had a satisfying conclusion with a dangling plot thread that will no doubt continue into the next book. So speaking of the next book, I'm not sure whether I'm going to continue with the series or not. Though I did enjoy it. I didn't find it earth shattering and the, and the strong religious message uh, kind of turned me off a bit. But I am kind of curious to see how it's all going to turn out between the two of them. So I might pick up the third book, a second book I should say. So yeah, so that's The Grim Life. I probably would give this book three and a half stars. So the last book that I read during the month of November was entitled The Hero of Ages by Brandon Sanderson. And yes, I finally finished the Mistborn trilogy. And wow, what a ride it was. Now, it's been several years since I've read a huge, epic, sweeping fantasy and I was totally blown away by this one. So since this is the last book in a series, there's really so very little that I can say about it without spoiling it for anyone, except that the world is dying and dying quickly. That the, uh, the Emperor and his wife are tricked into releasing an evil entity who is hell-bent on destroying the world. So now it's up to a brave few to try and stop the creature, or whatever it is, that is if it's not already too late. 
This book was superb, though it completely destroyed me and wrecked me. Uh, the bittersweet ending was both a thing of absolute beauty as well as heartbreaking. You know, it's one of those situations where you're outrageously happy and completely devastated at the same time. And though it all wasn't rainbows and unicorns, the ending somehow felt right to me, which is quite a feat for an author to pull off. And just to be clear, there were no unanswered or unexplained questions at the end of the trilogy, at least none that I could point out. So in this way, the conclusion was, uh, was very satisfying. So this series had amazing characters with a super kick-ass heroine whom I absolutely adored. The characters grew to be so much more than they had ever dreamed possible, and the growth throughout the arc of the story was phenomenal. Of the characters of uh, Eland, Vin, Sausage, Spook, even the Chandra. What I really loved about this novel was, uh, was the message that people are neither good nor evil. And even those whose actions appear to be evil and malicious in nature may not be completely so once we dig further down to unearth the truth. There's also the theme here of nothing is as it seems, which uh, happens to be one of my favorite tropes. There are just so many characters that I grew to love in this story, and out of 2,000 pages, it's going to be very difficult for me to leave them behind. I'm fairly certain that I'm going to be thinking about this story for a long time to come. I actually finished this a few days ago, and I'm still thinking about this story. Now, there is another Mistborn trilogy uh, published by Brendan Sanderson, uh, which is referred to as Mistborn Era 2, so I do get to return to this world. However, I believe it takes place 300 years after the first trilogy, so there will no doubt be brand new characters for me to love. So that is it for my November wrap-up part two. Um, how about you? Did you read anything good in November? Let me know in the comments. And I should also be posting my December TBR within the next day or two. So that is it for this time. As always, I thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate all of your support. And if you like this video, I'd appreciate it if you click the like button below as it really helps me out. And also subscribe to this channel if you'd like to be notified when I uh, release new videos. Also click the little bell icon. I think that's what you need to do to get notified. And now that is it for this time. I will talk to you in the next video. Roger it out. Ooh.